May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be always acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Leave it all on the field. Leave it all on the field. I would tell my team, teams inevitably, when we were leaving the locker room, going towards kickoff, I'd always say to them, leave it all on the field. Don't pace yourself. Don't hold anything back. Risk it all for 48 minutes, which is the length of a Texas high school football game. Leave it all on the field. And if you don't, on Saturday morning, you'll be sitting on the sofa in the den regretting the fact that you held something back. Leave it all on the field. You ever heard that before? Flannery, I bet you have, being the fine football player that you are. Leave it all on the field. Of course, I was a very tender and understanding coach. Uh, <clears throat> uh, leave it all on the field. And Jesus, like a good coach, is walking out of the temple uh, with his team, the 12 disciples. And he essentially tells them the same thing. He has just had it up to here, uh, being confronted by first the Pharisees, then the Sadducees, then the scribes, and then every other know-it-all that wants to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with him. He's had enough of these armchair quarterbacks that want to conduct business from the stands, that never really take the field. And he says, this is not the way it can be with you. I'm telling you right now, you need to be ready because you do not know the day or the hour that the Lord will return. And you don't know the day or the hour that he will call you home. So what I say to you, I say to all, stay awake and risk it all. Risk it all. And so Jesus, like any coach worth his or her salt, says, and I have a story about that. And he says, there was a boss man, there was a boss man who was decided to go on a long vacation to the Bahamas. And he called his three best employees and he said, I'm going to entrust, I'm going to entrust the capital of the, of the business with you. And so to his most trusted employee, he gave five talents, which may not sound much to you, but that is a hundred years of wages for one of the line employees, a hundred years of wages. To the second, he gave two, he gave two talents, which is 40 years, 40 years of, of, of wages for a line employee. And for the last, the third most trusted, he gave him one talent, which is not chump change because it's 20 years. Of, of wages for a line employed. He says, now, you know, do with it what I would do. And he goes off and sunbathes in the Bahamas. When he comes back, the, two, the one who received five talents and the one who received two invested, invested the capital uh, with the bankers and uh, they doubled the profits. He said, great. I'm giving you both a promotion. I'm giving you both a promotion. But the third one said, you, you, you know, boss, I knew that you're pretty tough. And so I, 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 just, I just played it safe and I dug a hole and I put all that money in it and covered it up. Here, have it. I dusted it off first, but here, have it. <clears throat> and the boss says, get out of my sight. Here's your pink slip. Hit the road. You don't have a place. You don't have a place in this establishment any longer. And then Jesus, after he tells the story, punctuates it with a very tough, with a very tough sentence. He says, to all who have, to all who have much more will be given in abundance. But for those who do not have, even that will be taken away from them. To those who have, much more will be given in abundance. But to those who have have nothing, even that will be taken away from me. You say, ooh, that doesn't sound like much like oh, tender Jesus. Jesus is saying to you and to me and to the 12, there is no time to wait. The time is now to risk it all, to invest all that you have, to invest your whole being, 
so that you can, you can share in the exuberance and the abundance of the kingdom that Christ alone offers. If we decide not to do that, the more we don't do that, the more we kind of just hold life close like this, the more we are swept away by egotism, the more we'll see life completely ebb away altogether. Invest it all. Leave it all on the field. Leave it all on the field. So what does that look like? What does that look like? Well, it looks like a buddy of ours. A buddy of mine and yours in the church um, taught me a lesson this week. Uh, now, you may know that Kay and I are trying to move from this, our century-old home into what I call an apartment, but she calls a condominium. You know, we're moving into the micro quarters, all right? <laughs> now, by the way, she has given away everything we own. <laughs> I'm just glad that I'm still in the house. I mean, you know, <laughs> you know I'm glad there's still a place for me. But, you know, she has really cleaned things out. Boy, that woman is notorious. She's the most unmaterialistic human being on earth, you know? Uh, so anyway, and so I'm trying to move things. Uh, we have one little storage room, room and we have, you know, and we have the condominium. And so I asked one of our good buddies to help me do some moving on Tuesday, which is my day off. And I wanted to get at it bright and early, you know, right? Bright and early. Well, he says, yeah, I can't be there. I can't be there until a little later. Well, I thought he meant like nine. Well, nine came and went. 10 came and went, then we're approaching 11, he finally shows up in his pickup truck. And I'm going, what's the problem? He goes, well, I had to take a friend of mine to the doctor. And I'm thinking to myself, couldn't somebody else do that? And the answer, of course, was no. His friend has, is a double foot amputee, okay? And he says, Pat, you know, he's hard to deal with. Number one, he, he is, uh, bears a lot of responsibility for the fact that he has had these amputations. And also, um, also, he's just very, he's very, well, toxic. He's hard to get moving. He's mean. In fact, he says really, really rough things to me, even as I'm putting him in the car to take him to the doctor. And uh, I, asked the, I asked the obvious question. I said, so why do you do it? Why, why do you do it? He, he looked at me kind of quizzically like, who ordained you? But, uh, <laughs> and uh, he said, well, number one, because I worked with him for 20 years. Number two, he is my friend. And number three, because I can do it. Because I can do it. And that third point really hit me. I can do it. The Lord has given me the grace, he says, to share it. And I've got it in me, and I can handle all the rough language. I can do it. That's what it looks like. You know, there was a, there was, Richard Carlson was a kind of a, a trendy business writer for a while, and he wrote a, he wrote a book called, um, called, um, don't sweat the small stuff, and it's all small stuff. I see Matt Bryant smiling back there. It was really a trendy book, you know. Don't sweat the small stuff, but it's all small stuff. Well, I, don't, I don't really like that title. I really like what Mother Teresa says. She says, there are no small acts. There's only small acts done with great love. There's only small acts done with great love. Look, folks, both you and I are, gonna, are not going to do anything, as far as I know, that's going to go down in a history book, right? But the Lord has given us the ability to do small things. To do small things in the, the field of our life. You know, um, maybe, maybe it's to call up a friend and, and help him along. Maybe it's to make that phone call or that we don't really want to make to a family member that hurt us long ago and we've been holding on to it. And the Lord says, you know what? It's been, that's been sitting out here too long. Maybe, 
You know, I'm always intrigued by the number of people who work at Sidewalk Saturday. And one of the first things you learn when you work at Sidewalk Saturday is the poor can be really tough. I mean, if you're looking for kind of sweetness and light, you need to think about something else because it can be tough because our lives are messy and when you don't have anything, they're even messier. And so be it. There are no small acts. Just, yeah, this is her words. There's no small acts, just small acts done with extraordinary love. This morning. Do you believe that? It's true, isn't it? Just small acts done with extraordinary love. Um, so how do we do it? How, how do we even start? We see what it, what it looks like. It looks like a friend who takes a very, um, very tough customer to the, to the, uh, to the doctor and, and bears with the bad language and everything. Um, but, but how do we do it? Well, the Bible tells us in Hebrews, the 12th chapter, I think it's verses 2 and 3, the writer writes this, and I think this is worth remembering. He says, keep your eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who, with the joy set before him, embraced the cross and scorned its shame, and now sits at the right hand of the Father. Consider him who suffered at the hands of sinful women and men and you will not grow weary and you will not lose heart. Wow. Wow. My favorite piece in that whole, that whole scripture is that for the joy set before him, he embraced the cross. What do you think the joy is that was set before Jesus? It wasn't that he was going upstairs to kick back, you know, in a lounge chair with the Father. The joy set before him was that he was going to set things right for you and me with, the, with God. That's the joy. He was going to pave the way so you and I didn't have to worry any longer. He was going to pave the way to do the work we can't do. The work we can't do, he can do. And that and, and the second part of that is that the exuberance that Jesus has, the exuberance of, 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 of offering it all, of not leaving anything on the field, not holding anything back, that same exuberance is given to you and me. Do you know that? That's our inheritance. That's the way it works. Jesus says, it's good that I go away. If I don't go away, the Spirit won't be given to you. The Spirit is given to us. That Spirit of absolute a, a, a bravery, of courage, of risking it all, of extending ourselves, of living a life that's vital and electric, all of that is bequeathed to you and me. Can you say amen to that? Amen. That's the life I want to live. And I don't care what age you are today, if you're young or if you're old, uh, if, if you got money, if you don't have any money, I'm telling you, the promise is the same. We don't have to worry about our relationship with God. It has been done for us. We don't trust in our own faithfulness. We trust in the faithfulness of Christ. That's the foundational statement of the Christian faith. But there's more. We don't have to live. We don't have to live bankrupt lives. Because the Lord has bequeathed his life on us. Wow, I like that, don't you? That's the way I want to live. To heck with living one of these lives where you're sitting on the sofa, sofa regretting all, this, all the junk you hadn't done or said, the phone calls you haven't made. Forget that. Forget it. That is not the Christian life. That's a pagan life. The Lord wants to give us the abundance that, that He has. Now, so I've told you, I've told you um, what it looks like, how we do it. Now I'm going to tell you why we do it. Jesus tells, him, tells us himself, he says this in the Sermon on the Mount. Let your light so shine before others that they may see the good that you do and give glory to your Father in heaven. Let your light shine like my friend with the truck who was late, was taking care of us. Let your light shine so much before others that people may see the good that you do and give glory to who? Your Father in heaven. Not to you or me, 
That's the reason why most of the stuff we do is small. Nobody pays, it, pays attention. We're not even supposed to. Everything we do should point to the Lord. If you think you're pretty nifty, well, guess what? Any niftiness in you has been given to you. My wife has a favorite thing to say to me when I start saying, oh, golly, we got these problems at the church. We gotta, I got to do this. I got to do this in the church. And she says, Pat, Pat, hold on. That church doesn't belong to you. That church belongs to Christ. And when I start doing things and I don't give the glory to, to the one to whom it belongs, I'm on the wrong path. So are you. Well, anyway, let me... Sh so, if that's... That is, uh, you know, um, why we do it, let me tell you a little story about what happens. Some years ago, there was a smallish man, quiet, who worked his entire life at Kelly Air Force Base. Well, I say his entire life, that was except for the interruptions of him serving in World War II in the Pacific and when he was called back into, into uniform in Korea. A good man, a good father, a good husband, married to a great teacher of reading uh, who served a good many years at James Madison. He, um, he, I think he was elected treasurer or something of his congregation, Trinity Episcopal Church on Wilson Boulevard, and um, he was called over here for a diocesan meeting, you know, with the financial people. So he, he drives over here, and already the parking lot's packed, so he's already a little nervous. He gets into the parish hall. It's packed with people that look like they know what they're doing, and he doesn't, or doesn't think he does. And so he has his papers, and he has his, he has his styrofoam cup of coffee. And so you know what happened. You know exactly what happened, right? He sits down, he's looking at the papers, and he knocks over the coffee. I mean, brown ooze goes everywhere. And a lady from our parish walked up to him and said, Hun, don't worry about that. Don't worry about that for one second. We've got, we've got someone who is going to clean that up. Well, of course, the guy's looking at this church. He's going, yeah, they probably got an army of maintenance people come clean it up. So when the, dude, when the guy shows up to, with the mop, tall, angular man, and he didn't, my friend doesn't even look up, and he's mopping, he knows he doesn't have on work shoes, he has on wingtips. And then once he mops it up, the man takes some paper towels out and gets on his hands and knees to finish cleaning it up. The tall man cleaning up the coffee was Tom Frost, the greatest banker, as far as I know, in the history of the state of Texas, on his knees. And my friend was immediately put at ease and going, is this the kind of church this is? Well, life happens. They kept on, they kept on going to their church. They were perfectly happy, but the church was closed. You know, Trinity Church is where Bishop Lillibridge was raised as a boy. <clears throat> so that's his church. It was closed, and that was heartbreaking. But my friend and his wife knew exactly where they're going to come to church because of that. So they came, and oh, you, um, you know, if um, if you kind of uh, look at where Martha Moore is seated, right there. Raise your hand, Martha. Raise your hand. That where Martha. That's where that couple always would always sit. Great people, tender, quiet, just going about their business. And uh, my friend died in 2016. His wife still attends here. In fact, she's here today. A very good friend of mine. And so life goes on. Um, all because of Tom Frost letting his light shine in a way that no one else would even pay attention to. Oh yeah, there's one other thing I need to tell you. That couple, that man who was so 
moved by the little thing that Tom Frost did? Three weeks ago, that man and his wife, the teacher, gave this parish $2 million to take care of the children in our parish and to take care of the children in the schools that we sponsor. I would say, that's leaving it all on the field, wouldn't you?